The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. I want us to proceed with our very important subject. We are looking at some dangerous spirit and we picked on the fault finding spirit as among those that we uh, grouped or christened as destructive spirits and before I do that I just want to remind you that last time we looked at the causes of a critical or a fault finding spirit and we said that there may be several factors that either one of them or a combination of them can actually get someone to the place of becoming fault finding. And we saw that we had the certain factor, certain factor, and we say that Satan actually, the Bible calls him the accuser of brethren in the sense that he can accuse brethren using your mouth or he can accuse you right into your spirit, speaking into your life and causing you to be doubtful of the love of God. Then we saw that the self factor we saw that there is a fear factor, the control factor, the negativity factor, the immaturity factor, as well as bad company. And we say that we all are very pharisaical at heart and we need to really be careful, be vigilant, because any of us can be caught up in this dangerous spirit of fault finding. Today I want us to proceed and look at uh, the dangers of the fault finding spirit. What are the dangers of the fault finding spirit? These are destructive spirits and they must be dangerous. The reason why they are dangerous is because they are destructive and it is important that we really, really look at uh, the dangers of the fault finding spirit. And I want us to read scripture together as always we do. In the book of Luke chapter 18, beginning from verse 9. Luke chapter 18, beginning from verse 9. And this is a parable that Jesus gave. And the Bible says, also he spoke to this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the tax collector standing afar off would not even so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. The dangers of the fault finding spirit. Now, the fault finding spirit, just like all other destructive spirits, is very, very dangerous. And the danger of this spirit lies in its capacity to tear apart churches, to destroy marriages, and also to break apart friendships. If you find any church that has been brought down, you check closely, you find there were people that God so possessed with a critical spirit, a fault-finding spirit, and they went after the leadership, and they went after even some of the members, and before you know it, there was a lot of discouragement and a lot of breakdown of fellowship. If you find a marriage that is not working, chances are that there is one party or both parties that are literally and every day scratching the surface to find fault with each other, with no one trying to attempt to even appreciate the other for whatever good that there is. If you find two friends that have been destroyed or two friends that cannot see eye to eye, chances are that one began to just see fault in the other. And before you know it, there was too much complaining. And what was once a flourishing relationship became 
a very bitter conflict and two people that have been close ended up together. Somebody say that the fault finding spirit is so destructive that it turns more hills into mountains. A more hill is just something that, you know, a more goes underground, digs a bit of soil, but when you are caught up in a fault finding spirit, that little heap of soil can become a huge mountain. It's like those who say that it turns, you know, uh, it builds a storm in a teacup. You know, a teacup is so small that for you to raise a storm there, you really have to be a specialist. And yet, that is true. When we become fault finders, then we can turn more hills into mountains and also create uh, storms in teacups as impossible as that would sound. So very quickly then, what are the effects of a critical spirit? And we are looking at the dangers of a critical or a fault-finding spirit. And I want you to be very keen and careful because these are very deep things and they have affected so many people and their lives and their work with God has been severely uh, hampered. The first danger of the fault-finding spirit is that it closes the heart of a person to loving God or from loving God. It actually hinders you, closes your heart from loving God. And in Matthew chapter 22, verse 37 and verse 39, this was a, the rich young ruler who went to Jesus and really wanted to know what he needed to do actually to be saved. And verse 37, the Bible says, Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Let me tell you something. Whenever you begin to harbor a critical spirit, it is very difficult to actually love your neighbor as you love yourself. And if you cannot love your neighbor as you love yourself, then it is not possible to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Because the first and the greatest commandment is that you love the Lord with all your heart, with all your mind, and with all your soul. But the second one is love your neighbor as you love yourself. When you are critical, you don't love your neighbor. There is no way you can be critical, fault-finding, and you actually love your neighbor. So for that matter then, a critical disposition closes off our hearts and minds and souls to loving God in any way because the Bible says in 1 John chapter 4, verse 20, if someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? Every time our hearts are closed from loving our neighbor, our brother, our sister, our friend, our workmate, because we are fault-finding and we pretend to be people who love the Lord, people that pray, people that give, people that go to church, the Bible simply says we are lying to ourselves because we cannot say that we love God and yet at the same time we hate our brother so much, we hate our sister so much that we are constantly finding fault and putting them down because there is no love in our heart. So for that reason, Reason, then you realize that this fault-finding spirit actually closes our hearts to loving God. It is not possible when you're fault-finding to love the Lord. You can say you love the Lord, but let me tell you, the love of God is expressed by loving other people. If you cannot open your heart to love someone else because they have fault and you keep finding fault with them, then forget the story of saying that you love the Lord because God allows us to love one another before we can love him. Love must first of all be horizontal before it can become vertical. That's the way God works in these matters. So a critical disposition, like we are saying, closes our hearts from loving the Lord. It closes our minds and our souls to loving God. And so we cannot actually obey this first commandment and the greatest one, which says, love the Lord God with all, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. It is not possible when we are critical, when we have 
when we are fault finding to come to the place whereby we actually demonstrate the love of God to anybody else. The second danger of a fault finding spirit is that it attracts judgment from God. Believe it or not, the moment we become critical, the moment we become judgmental, the moment we become fault finders, then we invite ourselves to be judged by God himself. The Bible says, now before we read scripture, a critical spirit displeases God and causes him to judge that particular sin. The moment we become critical, because we said last time, a critical spirit is manifested through judgmentalism. So when we appoint ourselves and become judges of other people's lives, then what we do, we invite the attention of God. God begins to realize or God sees that there is actually some other judges that are coming up and beginning to want to take his seat. And so he will go down and investigate. And in the process, we invite judgment from God. Luke chapter 6 verse 37. The Bible says, judge not and you shall not be judged. Condemn not and you shall not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. It is very easy for somebody that carries a fault-finding spirit to become a judge because they take it upon themselves to know the baseline truth and they are able to use some sort of benchmark to say, this is wrong, so you can't do it, and so you're wrong here, you're wrong there, and you're wrong here. And because of that, then you find that we flout the very principle of judge not. The Bible says, judge not, and you shall not be judged, and condemn not, and you shall not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. It's amazing how when we go wrong, we actually want mercy, we want favor, we want forgiveness. And yet so many of us, especially we have been caught up by the spirit of fault finding, you find that it's very easy to judge, but when people judge us, we take it personally. It's very easy to condemn, and when people condemn us, we are so offended, we don't like it. And so let me tell you that it is biblical to judge not, it's biblical, because if we judge, then we shall be judged. If we condemn, we shall be condemned, and if we don't forgive, we shall also not be forgiven. Matthew chapter 7, verse 2. The Bible says, For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. One of the challenges of taking it upon ourselves, especially being influenced by the fault-finding spirit and becoming judges, is because we are not able to accept the same measure. You find that if people judge us the same way, we take it personally. And yet the Bible clearly says that if you are ready to become a judge, if you are ready to be a fault finder and to judge people for their mistake, you must be prepared that the same measure that you use against others, the Bible says the same will be used against you and it will be measured back to you. The third cause, or rather the third danger of fault finding is that it brings or causes strains in relationship. It is strains relationships. In Proverbs chapter 15 verse 1, the Bible says, a soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. I want you to realize that when we are caught up by a spirit of fault finding, we are not very kind. People that are judgmental are not kind. And that's why even in a court of law, sometimes as much as the judge wants to speak, you know, politely, it is still has to come out harsh because then if it is not harsh, it is like removing the sting of the judgment from the whole process. And so you find that sometimes it is very difficult to be a fault finder. It's very difficult to be a harsh critic and not be harsh and not be difficult and use hard hitting words. The Bible says that when we answer softly, it turns away wrath. But when you speak a harsh word, it stirs up anger. Now, how does the fault finding spirit strain relationship? A critical spirit puts a person in an authoritative position over others. That's why when the judge enters into a courtroom, everybody stands up because the judge comes because they, are, they have authority in matters of judgment in that particular court. So when you take it upon yourself to be a fault finder, then what you do 
upon the people that you find fault on is like you take a superior position over them. You are superior. You are standing on what they call a ivory tower. You are standing on a higher moral ground. So you have responsibility and reason to judge them. That's why people are clever. When they are confronted with a situation they know they don't qualify, they will say, I have no moral authority to judge you. I have no capacity to judge you because if I do that, then I'll place myself upon an area where I am not qualified to judge you. And that's why if you remember when Jesus confronted or rather was confronted uh, confronted the people that brought the woman who was caught up in adultery, he said them and told them one thing, that if any of you does not have any sin, cast the first stone onto another. Jesus was saying, I want to bring all of you to the level of this woman, that none of you has the moral authority to judge her because you are distorted. You are not able to actually bring out proper judgment because a critical spirit puts a person in an authoritative position over others. And people tend to separate themselves from harsh and critical authority. Just check anywhere. If you find someone who is very harsh, naturally people do not gravitate towards them. And, and that's normal. I mean, even in the family, if you find your group of your siblings and one of you is very tough on the rest of the family, you find that the rest of the family tends to pull away from that person because naturally we are attracted to people. We feel that they appreciate us. They acknowledge that we have shortcomings, that there are certain things that we don't do very well. And yet that is very true, that when sometimes we become very harsh and critical, we literally push people away from us because nobody wants wants to be confronted with the reality that they already know. Long time ago, I came to understand that many, 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 many people know they already have problems. Many people already know that they have shortcomings in their life. So when we spend a lot of time pointing out the evils and the ills of people in their life, instead of encouraging them that way, they tend to become detestful and they don't want to hear us anymore. No wonder when Jesus came, and especially to those who are broken by sinfulness and they gravitated towards him, it was because he loved them. They never judged them because he spoke spoke well of them and he encouraged them and gave them hope instead of confronting them with the fact that they are failures and they cannot amount to anything. A critical spirit puts a person in an authoritative position over others and people tend to separate themselves from harsh and critical authority and therefore this therefore isolates a critical person from fellowshipping with others. And that's why I'm saying that when we carry a critical or a fault-finding spirit, it strains our relationship. If I have to relate with you and every time we meet, you are pointing out at my weaknesses every minute. You are showing me how wicked or how, you know, unbecoming I am. You are showing me how failed I have become in my life. You are showing me every shortcoming that I have. Then I get to a place whereby I feel so weak, I feel so demoralized that I would rather avoid you because I know every time I meet you, I'll be confronted with a situation that is not good and yet probably I already know that I have that problem. We are looking at the dangers of the fault-finding spirit. We have already seen, number one, that it closes somebody's heart to loving God. When you are fault finder, you cannot see good in people and you cannot love them. And if you can love people, then you cannot claim to love God. We have also seen danger number two of fault finding spirit that it attracts the judgment of God. When you make yourself a judge, you also place yourself under authority of God to be judged because you have become a judge. And number three, we have seen danger number three of the fault finding spirit, it is strains relationship. If you find people who relate together and one is always pointing, you know, eels or the other, or both people are busy digging out and checking out the wrong thing you did, that kind of relationship will not last because you're always finding fault and people find it difficult to exist in such a kind of envir an environment. The fourth danger of the fault finding spirit is it distorts perception. It distorts perception. Distorted perception can easily be explained by taking, you know, a clear glass of or clear glass of water and you put a, a stick in it. When you notice where the stick enters the water, it looks like the stick is bent. That is what we call 
a distorted perception. The stick is not actually distorted. It's just that your perception, because of the different densities of air and water, at the point, what they call it the point of inflection, that point where the water and even air come into, into contact, that is a point of inflection because your eyes are cheated by what you see that actually the stick is crooked, but actually it is not. That is called distorted perception. I'm saying that one of the dangers of the fault-finding spirit is that it distorts our perception. And Jesus put it very clearly in Matthew chapter 7, verse 3. He says, and why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but you do not consider the plank in your own eye? Jesus was simply faulting people who look at other people and see big mistakes, and yet they cannot see themselves that they have a bigger mistake. There's a difference between a plank and a speck. A plank is a huge piece of wood, maybe uh, 12 by 2 inches. That's a huge plank, maybe 15 feet long. But a speck is a little tiny thing that has been chipped by a plane when you are trying to smooth and timber. Jesus was simply saying, when you are operating under the fault-finding spirit, what will happen is your vision is so distorted, your perception is so distorted that when you look out, you see a plank and you think it is in somebody's eye, but actually it is because it is in your eye. That person only has a speck, so you need to do something about what you're seeing. Fault-finding distorts perception in a number of ways, and I'll give you just three of them. One, the fault finder views themselves as superior. That's already distorted because the truth is you are not superior because the question is who told you you are superior because God is the only one who judges. So the first way that we realize that we have a distorted perception when we operate under the spirit of, uh, of, of the fault finding spirit or critical spirit is that we view ourselves as superior to other people. That view of superiority upon other people is already distorted perception because that is not true. Number two, it distracts the fault finder from their own faults due to preoccupation with the weaknesses of others. Sometimes we can be so busy trying to dig out and expose other people's weaknesses that we forget that we have our own weaknesses to pay attention to. And because we are so preoccupied, we make ourselves judges, judging other people. We never have time to look into ourselves and ask ourselves, what is wrong with me? And so you find that one of the other ways in which uh, fault-finding distorts perception is that it distracts whoever is fault-finding from their own faults and due to preoccupation with the weaknesses of others. We are so busy digging out other people's weaknesses, other people's you know, shortcomings, that we actually forget that maybe even the same or worse shortcomings that we are busy digging out are also very present within ourselves. And then the other way in which fault finding distorts perception is that it causes spiritual far-sightedness, spiritual far-sightedness, focusing on other people's things. Our spiritual eyes begin to play tricks on us as we see right through things that are much closer. That is our own faults. And I say that earlier. When you are your, 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 your perception is vaulted. When you look ahead, you see like what you're seeing is in somebody, but, but it's actually in you because your perception is distorted. Your spiritual eyes have been, you know, so cheated that because of being so busy digging out other people's things, you don't realize that these are actually your own problem. It's called spiritual far-sightedness. You can see far, you can see other people's problems, but you cannot see close by. There are people who are far-sightedness. You know, they, they can see things that are far, but they can't see things that are close. That is a spiritual malady, and it needs to be sorted out. And especially when you understand its cause is because you're operating with a critical or fault-finding spirit, so it has distorted your perception. Now, our own imperfections fade as we watch the scenes of others paraded before us. You see, if you spend too much time digging out and trying to see how other people are bad, what happens is you easily and very quickly forget that you also have issues and problems. And that's where you find people that stand on the ivory tower of criticism never remember that they have problems. And that's why someone one time said, when you are living in a glass house, do not throw stones. 
Many times, people, because they are focusing on others, they forget that even they themselves, although they want to stone other people's glass houses, they also live in a glass house. They are so busy, you know, looking at the other house that they forget that even their own house is actually a glass house. And that's why sometimes when people ridicule others and laugh at others when they're in problems, and then people wise enough also point out their own weaknesses then everything falls down because the embarrassment of knowing that what you are trying to correct is also very much present within you it is because our own imperfections fade as we watch the scenes of others paraded before us if we ridicule others content in believing that our sins are hidden from them then we become hypocrites and that's what jesus says in matthew 23 Verse 27, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inside are full of dead men's bones and uncleanness. What Jesus was simply saying, he was saying, you guys, you are busy focusing on other things and you paint yourself white outside, but inside the Bible says, he told them that you actually appear indeed beautiful outwardly, but inside you are full of dead men's bones and uncleanness. That was a very serious indictment of a spirit of criticism that had gripped the Pharisees to a point that they were so busy criticizing him and his disciples and other people, and they weren't able to see that actually they are full of rottenness and wickedness and uncleanness in their lives. If we project our flaws onto others, perhaps our attitude towards them is a barometer of our own poor performance. Let me tell you why it is very bad to use other people as a measure of how good you are. We already saw in our last week's service that Jesus Christ is our standard. So if I look at you and I see that you're not doing very well and I make myself, or rather I look at what you're doing and decide that since you're doing that way, then whatever I'm doing must be good. And yet your standard is not the standard of faith that we need to walk in. That's why you find some people say that if Christians live the way they are living, then I'm not going to be a Christian. That's the same problem where we use the wrong barometer and we end up missing out on the blessing of God because we are basing our measurements on the wrong barometer. You can never use other people's lives to actually determine how life should be lived. Romans chapter 2 verse 1. Therefore you are inexcusable. O man, whoever you are, who judge? For in whatever you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who, you who judge practice the same thing. That's what the apostle was saying. He was saying, please be careful because when you quickly judge, then you realize that you're doing the same thing that you're also doing. And because you are so much, you know, uh, captivated by the need and the desire to put someone else down and to judge someone else, then you forget that you are also working on the same problem. You know, if you find someone who specializes in criticizing other people, they believe they are so perfect that even when they need mercy, they struggle to receive it. People that do not forgive find it very hard to forgive because they live a legalistic life. And because they have never brought themselves to a place of appreciating that they actually need help, then they are not able to receive mercy. Thank you for tuning in. God bless you. The order of our services is as follows. From 9 a.m. to 9.30 a.m., we have the intercessory prayers. And from 9.30 a.m., we have the main service, which runs concurrently with the teens and children's church. You are all welcome.